We went live. Yay. Yes. Of course, it's always in theory until somebody collapses the wave function. Acknowledge us. <laughs> Acknowledge us. That's what it really is about is we just want people to know that we exist. Just to really, do you hear us? Do you see us? Do you see what we're saying? Do you get us? Yeah. Now I, you have like the beginnings of a lyric in my head and I can't remember the rest of the song or what it's from. And I think it's coming from Pink Floyd. I think so too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that you say that. Um, hey everybody. Welcome to a perfectly normal episode of Astronomy Cast where we're going to talk about black holes. What a surprise. Yeah. And, and we scheduled this weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Yeah, we had no idea. In fact, and so we're, we're going to change the schedule and Nancy Graziano is going to be surprised and shocked to hear this. But um, I think we're going to add an episode next week just about the, uh, the, the Nobel Prize in physics because it's all about black holes. And, and I think it would be great to just to, to trace the science papers that led to the Nobel Prize. And so we'll just talk about each one of these. And uh, in some cases, sets of papers. Oh, yeah. And you know, it's like a trail of of cleverness. Um, and, you know, and we have already last week, I think, you know, we fan peopled fan boy girl yeah. out on on the yeah. uh, on the discoveries and the discoverers and so i think we don't quite stand moved. them but we definitely fan them <laughs> right exactly yeah so i think you'll 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 hear a version of that but i but i think as well you know when we we've, we've been a little bit more prepared we can actually go through the the individual some of the papers and the ideas and the discoveries one after the other that led us to nobel prizes for three worthy people yes. so yeah um who are nice i'm just gonna keep saying i know that. i know i know um, all right, I'm going to say hello to some people. Hello to Andy Cowley, Anti Gravity Nonsense, Beth Johnson, Bill Smith, Douglas Clausen, DPI 209, Elad Avron, Eric Knapp, Giselle Severin, Gordon Dewis, Grand W, Guido Bibra, Hal McKinney, Helg Bjorkog, Henrik Bo Anderson, Ian Farkeron, Jamie S., John Garner, John Suffill, John Victor, Johnny Zed, Jorn Albert, Kjartan uh, Savre, um, Linda Sadiq, Mrs. Nat, Nancy Graziano. Um, Nicholas B, um, Paul Disney, Paul Gracie, Ross Armstrong, Ryan Schmitz, Sir Goosey, Thomas Traniker, Zach Perry, Zafan, Zafan, and Zog Harms. Oh no, Zafan, somebody's got a name after you. Oh, <laughs> you're the, you're the person who I would say, hello everybody. Uh, so and then I have Null people? Denominator and DPI 209 and anyone who said hi on Twitch earlier, I'm sorry, but I forgot to open the chat. Oh, it doesn't it doesn't store the participants talking. in the way that YouTube does, no. Oh, Zach yeah. Perry is saying there was a rant from Paul. I can you put a link to that? I would love to see Paul's rant. I love Paul's rants. I'm assuming that's a Paul Matt right. Sutter rant about the Nobel Prize and he went off in some way. I uh Paul I, you know, as an absolute enthusiast for space and astronomy, I require people like Pamela and Paul and Ethan Siegel and Brian Koberline to, to ground me, to bring me back to reality, to, uh, to reset my expectations. Um, so I have a piece of news. Um, people are always asking me like, how's your Chinese going? So, yes. so I just finished the first book, a Simplified Hansa One. Today, I just finally finished cramming 1,500 Chinese characters into, no, finished cramming is not the right way to describe it. I finished beginning to learn them. So in other words, all 1,500 have come up through my Anki software. And so now over the next lifetime Years. really yeah they'll they'll continue to show up for me and so what that looks like is me filling up my book of chinese characters 
Uh, so there's 22,000 characters in this book. I'm halfway through the second book, and that's where I hit the number. And there is a, there's a second book of another 1,500 characters, Simplified Hansa 2, which I have not, uh, I dare not even begin. because. Do you have a special pen that you use? I do, yeah. I have nice calligraphy pen. Thomas, that's Japanese. That does not help me. Um, so, uh, will Elon Avram, when will I be good enough to read the three body problem in the original Chinese? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. And the answer to that question is, um, let me tell you how much of the three body problem I can understand. Um, is there a way to look that up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yes. It is. I understand 69% of the three body problem. I could read 69% of it. So, and I intend to start soon. I'm actually reading other stuff in, in, in Chinese right now. Do you, do you have a way to cross correlate the vocabulary you supposedly know in the vocabulary of a book? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. What is that? That is magic. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty cool. It's a piece of software called Chinese text analyzer. And so you, you build up a vocabulary of the text of the, of the words that you theoretically know. Yeah. And then, and then it parses out any document and puts the stuff that you do know as black. It puts the stuff that you don't know as red. And if you ask it to tell you what the word means, then it shifts it to blue and considers it a word that you're learning and won't let you say that you know it until you stop, um, asking it asking. for reminders. So, and it calculates exactly, and it can output the words that you don't know, and then you import that into your Anki and learn those words specifically. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, it is such a um, amazing time to try to learn a language. There's just so many resources. I mean, just like Netflix alone, you just sit and watch Netflix shows all day and, and you learn a language. So, I was watching something the other day that's a Russian sci-fi show, and I couldn't figure out how to watch it in Russian instead of English. Like, is there no Russian audio? Like, it's only dubbed? Because you can go into, into, um, you go into the, sorry, everybody, for, for rabbit holing here. I don't know if this is interest to anybody. Um, so you go into, say, Netflix, and you can pick the audio version and the subtitle version and so it can be oh. english it can be and if they've dubbed it into other languages you can do that and then okay. you can see the subtitle version but there's a there's a plug-in called learning languages with netflix which takes uh -huh. the next level and will actually show you two different subtitles simultaneously so it'll show you the english one and it'll show you or it would show you the russian one and it'll show you the english one and it'll hide the english one so you see the Russian one, you try to guess what it's saying, and then you show the English one and you see if you were right. And it helps okay. just kind of accelerate your, your learning. So it's- I'm the... gonna have to go looking for that. Yeah, so have you started to watch some stuff in Russian? No, I, oh, I, I had a, this could be in Russian, right click. I don't see how, and I'm yeah. multitasking yeah. and- yeah, yeah, no, you should totally, I mean, oh, I mean, don't begin this process unless it's a thing that you really want to do because, I mean, you already speak Russian, so this is a refresher for you. So yeah, I think it would be and, very and handy. I just brought a Russian key bot. I just bought a Russian oh, keyboard. Oh, well, then you're in. Yeah, you're, you're, the yeah. rabbit hole has begun. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it's good. It's, uh, I mean, that's a lie. It's a horrible nightmare, which is just causing pain and suffering. But, but uh, that life is pain. And it's, it's good for us. Have you hit the problem yet of forgetting what language your keyboard is in and confusing yourself? No, because uh, they don't have a different language keyboard. So the, the, the weird thing is that we, when you're writing Chinese, when you're writing simplified Chinese, you're actually writing English, uh, little English, you're, you're, sounding out the sounds in English. And even the people in Chinese do this. So, so in China, they're writing 26 characters to create the language. It's a very bizarre thing. I know. Yeah. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. I yeah. So have nothing more. Yeah. If you want to say that. how, which means good, then you write H A O 
and then the little character for for how pops up and then you accept it and then that drops in that character so so you're sort of you're you're writing out the syllables of every word bit by bit by bit which is super Dang. weird yeah yeah it's a it is a very complicated uh uh process and there's other methods there's other keyboards as well that they use but that's the one that that's the way when people are typing when they're text messaging each other and stuff they're they're writing that out all right um i know i know it's crazy but the best advice i have for anybody trying to learn language just watch tv which is like just the best advice for anything just watch tv um okay but I'm, i think some people use astronomy cast for learning english right they do yeah they do so they're doing the same thing I, I will say my favorite moment of Russian TV ever was watching the Muppets in Russian <laughs> and entering the room just in time to hear Shvina Cosmosia. And it's it's just like Miss Piggy in Russian is even more delightful. <laughs> That's awesome. Um Okay, so uh, if you're wondering what it is you stumble into, we're going to record an episode of Astronomy Cast. Uh, we'll take however long it takes, and then we will switch around and we will uh, answer your questions about space and or astronomy. So let me know. This is 581? 582. Okay. He says almost certainly. <laughs> Uh, while you're prepping this, George Edgerog asks, besides James Webb, are there any probes at or planned to be at Lagrange points? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did They're a filled. three part series about the Lagrange points, uh, the five Lagrange points, and that there are spacecraft at, at many of them. They all have different purposes. No one's at the L3. On the That's other the side. the one? It's the one on the other side of the sun. Oh. Right. Yeah, you can't really communicate there so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's nothing there, but there are but there are probes at the Earth, and there's no probe at the Earth Moon L three, which is on the other side of the Earth. But there are many probes at L one, L two, um, yeah. and there are, and I don't think there's anything at L four and L five, but they're really good places for stuff. Just nobody's done it. And that's the thing about L2 that people forget is the moon's constantly moving. So something at L2 doesn't live in perpetual shadow of the moon. Right. Because the moon isn't always yeah. there. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me know when you're ready. Um, sure. Kind of need something more certain than that. I'm pressing record. Okay. I'm going to press record too. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Astronomy Cast, episode 582, Building Bigger Black Holes. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of the Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of science at CosmoQuest. I'm just the director of Cosmic. The Quest. whole director, not just the director of science. I, I know. I have to do way too much budgeting to simplify the name to director of science. You wish you got to do more <laughs> science, less administration. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know the feeling. Yes. Yeah. How are <laughs> but you? But speaking of budgeting, for Cosmo Quest, we're doing our hangout a thon next weekend. Awesome. So October twenty fourth, twenty fifth, this weekend, for those of you listening on the podcast. We're going to do 36 straight hours of fundraising in the name of keeping the science going for fiscal year 21. Now, normally, I would say that's madness. What kind of maniac will attempt 36 hours? That's impossible. And yet you've done this many years. So this is just same the time to do this again. It's just well, like going we're to adding for something you. entirely new this year. We are going to do a full scale, but not full scale. We're going to do a scale model of the full solar system. We're including the 34 largest objects in the solar system. So there's moons, there's an asteroid, because it turns out asteroids are tiny. There's a bunch of Kuiper belt objects, all the planets, sun. And 
And we're doing this in collaboration with the 8-Bit community here on Twitch. And um, this was the idea of Paranor, one of our dear colleagues who passed away a couple of weeks ago. And we're, we're doing this in honor of him. And, and we're hoping that any of you out there who love to Minecraft, love science, will please be part of this and donate in the process. I might while drop we're doing in and, and Minecraft with you guys for a little bit. Oh, yeah. Right on. I'll get my kids to show up too. Um, all right. So did you hear the news? Nobel prizes for black holes. Now we know there are stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, but how do you get from one to the other? How do black holes get more massive? And before you send us the email, the title is building bigger black holes. It's just for the alliteration. It's really about building more massive black holes, more massive. Actually, that's not bad too. Hmm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Pamela, how big is a black hole? Well, it depends on how big they feel like being. I, so theoretically, a black hole can range from something that is microscopic and created through a natural version of the Large Hadron Collider and then range all the way up to billions of solar masses. Now, the reality is the only ones we've detected are from a few stellar masses to that billions of solar masses. And we're still struggling to find things in between those two, but the situation's getting better than it was a few months ago. Um, and I think it's, I, I think definitely, as I mentioned at the beginning there, you know, it's not entirely accurate to say how big a black hole is because we don't actually know how big a black hole is. All you can measure about a black hole is its mass, its spin and its charge. Well, and, and this is where big and small get to be confusing adjectives because you can say that room has a low temperature, you can say it has a small heat energy, and those are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, so when we say big, we just mean massive, right? Yeah, we do. Right. And, and here it ties to the size of the event horizon, but I think we're starting to get ahead of ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So I think we'll talk about the, the idea of those microscopic black holes sort of near the end of the show. Let's talk about the traditional kinds of black holes that we, that we know about right now. Well, in general. You start out with a star that is initially more than 10 solar masses. Anything below 10 solar masses, we think over the course of its lifetime is going to lose so much material to its environment through solar winds, mass loss events, that it's going to creep itself down to be small enough that it will die as a neutron star or a white dwarf. But if you're above that 10 solar mass limit, when you die, if you're a star, you will experience a supernova where some of that material gets blasted off, but what's left in the core as it collapses down, it starts to say, hey, can I be supported by electron degeneracy pressure? And the electrons are like, no, I do not have the ability to support this. Collapses down. Neutron degeneracy pressure tries to kick in. It goes, no, neutrons also cannot support this. And then we don't really know what happens. It just keeps collapsing such that the mass is confined within a volume smaller than what light can escape from. So, so here on Earth, we've used this description many times. We're on a people black hole. Right. I can jump as hard as I want. <laughs> I love and that description. I'm not leaving this planet. Yeah. Yeah, no person, no matter how strong they are, can ju can escape a bl escape the Earth by jumping. But light can go fast enough. Rockets can go fast enough. So there's a way to get information off of our world. Now, as things get bigger, they stop being escapable by rockets. They stop being escapable, in fact, by everything except for light. And at the point that even light isn't going fast enough, they become a black hole. So right. the definition of a black hole is something that as you approach the surface, you hit a point 
where the velocity you have to go to get away exceeds the velocity of light. And that always leads to people asking, oh, great. So if you could just go faster than the speed of light, could you escape a black hole? And unfortunately, the answer to that is also no, but mostly because a black hole has completely tangled up space time in a way that all roads lead back to the singularity. So even if you then yeah. go faster than the speed of light, it's kind of cruel. It's kind of mean that, you know, yeah, if you the launch your warp drive, you're still ending up in the middle of the black hole. Yeah. So, so black hole is just an exceedingly dense object. Even the earth, if you crammed all of our matter into a small enough volume would become a black hole. Um, it's just that how fast you need to go to get off the surface issue. Right. Now, the surface of a black hole in this con context is that place where the escape velocity becomes the speed of light. We don't know anything about what goes on beneath that surface. Right, right. So, so we're just so going to ignore it here. A, a black hole, and I, a, you know, we've talked about this in the past as well, this idea that once the event horizon is just that, is that speed limit. If you're just outside the event horizon, then light can escape. If you're just inside the event horizon, the light can't escape. And that's, that's what defines it. And that's what makes it look like a black hole is that that's the point where the light gives up is that very moment. And, and what I love is you can actually get photons of light in orbit yeah. around black holes. And there's also evidence of light that has its path bent so that it goes around a black hole and then hits the accretion disk and reflects off. So you can get all sorts of weird things with light going on. And this is why when we look at images like the Event Horizon Telescope, we're not looking at a structure the way we think of them. What we're looking at is how the light is bent around a place in space. Right. And so, and we're going to talk about this more next week, one of the incredible discoveries, or I guess the evidence was starting to build that there were, we knew about these, these less massive black holes, these stellar mass black holes, these ones that had come from stars with 10 times the mass of the sun through, you know, a few of them had been found in the, in the Milky Way, but there was this growing discovery that there was actually another version of these black holes at the hearts of galaxies. Yes. And this goes back to the discovery of quasars. There are in the cores of many galaxies, a concentration of light such that that concentration of the light in the center is significantly brighter than the entire rest of the galaxy. So when you're looking at a quasar that's at a great distance, that disk surrounding the, the quasi-stellar object in the center, not visible. All you see is this star-like thing. But when astronomers first looked at the atomic line spectra, they didn't see anything that made sense until someone realized, shoot, all the lines are so redshifted that this isn't a star. This is a galaxy significantly far away that has all of its light shifted. Right. So in trying to understand what's going on in the centers of these galaxies for decades people were drawing overhead sheets with a monster in the center and saying there's a monster in the center of galaxies and people would talk about well maybe it's a massive black hole or something mm -hmm. but it wasn't until the late 90s that we started to have the technological ability to say the amount of mass confined within this small of a volume says there must be a massive black hole here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we now know that the mass is not just a massive black hole, it's a super massive black hole. It's not just several times the mass of a black, a normal stellar mass black hole, not thousands, it is millions of times. Two billions. Two billions, possibly even up to hundreds of billions, I think even trillions at this point. Millions and billions is what we've seen. Yeah. So we'll go with that. I, I, I'm going to double check while you're talking, but, but please continue. So yes, billions. And so when you think about like, if you have these black holes, one black hole over here, one black hole over there, 
how can you possibly get from something with 10 times the mass of the sun to something that has tens of billions of times the mass of the sun? How, and Pamela, explain it to me. <laughs> So when we were first trying to figure this out, the idea was, well, maybe you have a swarm of black holes and they merge together and you get a massive black hole. And trying to figure out the time scales that that would take and how to build something fast enough to allow massive galaxies to exist in the earliest moments of the universe was deeply confusing. And because human beings like to simplify things. For the longest time, there was this question of, do galaxies grow in a, take a massive amount of material and collapse it down to the entire galaxy all at once, or do they grow through a bunch of little things coming together and merging to build bigger and bigger things over time. And this was not a some grow through one, some go through the other argument. This was a which of these two things is it for everything? Right. Human beings have problems. And it turns out the universe wasn't into this either or, it was into an and. And it was realized that if you have a massive amount of material gravitationally pulled in by a halo of dark matter that that infalling material can fall in with turbulence and the turbulence has a way of distributing the energy such that all the material can end up funneling into the center not all of it a massive amount of material is capable of funneling into the center of this forming structure and forming the supermassive black hole simultaneous to the formation of the rest of a giant elliptical galaxy, a large spiral galaxy maybe, but we can't see that clearly. Right. So I'm going to go with giant elliptical. Um, and, and so it's this turbulent process that is capable in some instances where you start with a large dark matter halo of generating a supermassive black hole in a single go. So, so, and I guess this was the question was, could you, did you need to have a star born reaches, you know, runs hot and fast and dies a million years later, leaves behind a black hole that's 20 times the mass of the sun, and then two of them crash together. And now you've got a black hole with 40 times the mass of the sun, and two of those crash into each other. And now you've got one with 80 times the mass of the sun, like you couldn't you can by doubling with a lot of black holes. You can get there. You can get there. And but but you're saying that they don't think that's what happened. They think that there was some kind in of all cases. And this is the catch is is that doubling, which we'll talk more about in a moment, you can do it. It will get you what you need. But the time scales weren't working out. How do you have massive structures formed pretty much from the beginning of structures being formed? So the thought is that for the largest systems, the inflow of material to form that entire system, the turbulence in it allowed enough material to collect in the core to cause that supermassive black hole to be formed simultaneous with the system. Now, we know that that today there is a limit to the size that stars can form. Like at a certain point, the star, the 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 solar winds blow and it blows material off from trying to make its way into the star and the star, you know, whatever it is, a few hundred times the mass of the sun is the upper theoretical limit of, of how big a, a star can be. And so that that defines the minimum possible black hole that you're going to get. It's heavy. It's yeah. 100 plus times the mass of the sun. But it's not. Um, it's not a million. It's, to it's a not million a million times, times the, the size mass of, of the sun. sun. Yeah, and so you do have to start that start that process. So, so was there something different about the early universe that allowed maybe more massive black holes to form, or even just one big black hole at the center of a galaxy? It it wasn't the kind of difference that that you might go, hey, I wonder if that could still exist today. It was more a matter of 
as the universe went from this diffuse gas after the formation of the cosmic microwave background, there were places of higher density and lower density. And the higher density places were able to pull in material. And the echoes of where those knots were in the early universe continued to be reflected in the modern universe. Over time, the things that started out high density have only gotten higher and higher and higher density. The places that started out low density have only gotten emptier and emptier and emptier. It was the highest density places in that early universe that were able to say, okay, matter, come to me and pull everything in. And other places that started out with still an over density, but not as massive a one formed smaller galaxies. And this is where that both ways of forming comes in. So we also had small galaxies forming that it looks like the smallest galaxies don't necessarily have unusual black holes in them. But they do have stars of all sizes. Right. And that means some of these stars are going to form black holes. And as these systems interact, as these systems over time go, hey, mm -hmm. I'm gravitationally attached to you, and they merge over time, those black holes can find each other as the interactions cause the heaviest mass objects to fall into the centers of these systems. And this is where slowly over time, you can have these stars coming together. You can have these right. dead stars that are black holes coming together and build over generations Right. Through a second mechanism, bigger and bigger black holes. Right. And I guess that's, you know, and so I'm, you know, when I'm sort of imagining this three dimensional whirlpool at the beginning of the universe with the dark matter forming this, the agitator that's spinning up and, and directing the material as it's infalling. And you've got black holes that have formed from various stars that are. That, that are falling down this gravity well into the center, being directed into the center of this, of this maelstrom. And they're finding each other in a way that is much easier than, than if they were just drifting randomly across the universe. And is that, is that sort of where we're going here? That there's like a, that there is a, I'm, I'm like, like, again, I'm imagining water going down a drain, except the water that's going down the drain is containing rare earth magnets and the rare earth magnets are finding each other and clipping into bigger and bigger magnets. I don't know if that analogy holds. I, well. I think that's an excellent analogy, actually. Okay, good. Um, and you have other reasons that drive things into the center of mass from frictional interactions with gas and dust. Um, all sorts of different things can cause your mass to get redistributed and increase the probability that massive objects right. will find one another. But do the black holes have to go through this, this bl black hole, individual black hole phase, stellar mass black hole phase, or can you just have it all just turn into one black hole? Can one well, black hole early just universe? Form? Yes. Modern universe. No. Right. Okay. So early universe was, did they think there was even a limit in the early universe about how big these black holes could get? Yes. Black holes have a built in throttle where as material falls in <sighs> angular momentum's a bear and the angular momentum of the object of the material that's trying to fall into the black hole has to be radiated away it, it the material can't just like hi i'm falling straight into the black hole and this means that the material falling into a black hole in the process of feeding it which is the other way black holes grow um that material that is feeding into this to the black hole it's going to get denser and denser and denser eventually kicking in having its own thermonuclear reactions giving off its own light through thermal and um, thermonuclear reactive processes and the pressure from that light coming off that disk of infalling material will actually be sufficient to choke off additional material right. from falling in it will clear out the insides of of a galaxy and it's this throttling process of the light saying, I've got more force than gravity at this moment. Right, the light right. pressure overcoming the gravitational pull. 
it puts a limit on supermassive black hole growth. Because I know that that astronomers did the math of saying, okay, if you just fed a black hole as much as it wanted to eat, you couldn't get a supermassive black hole at the age of the universe that we see them today. So you it's true. So you can't just feed a black hole to get the size that you want. It's just the same like you can't again back to my bathtub analogy, you you can't have all of the water in your bathtub instantly drain out it takes time it spins yeah. around yeah. right um so you so you have to have some process where these in individual black holes are are being formed and then they're merging together yes. and fortunately we now see evidence of black holes merging together thanks to ligo yes and and so now we're looking at you can have various size supermassive black holes in the beginning of the universe form through a massive turbulent process, those galaxies can then merge forming the most massive supermassive black holes we see today. You can also have stellar mass black holes and early stars were much more massive and very different from what we see today. And I'm not gonna pretend that we fully understand how these metal poor stars lived and died. Mm -hmm. But all of the models that we have indicate they would have been far larger on average than the stars that we have today, which means potentially more stellar mass black holes forming than we have today um, through generations of stars. And so you have this richness of massive objects dying. Those massive objects dying have the potential to then merge together and at the same time to gobble up the material around them. You have a black hole forming in a high density star forming region. It's going to suck some stuff in as it goes. And, and so there's myriad ways to grow these things over time. Mergers, sucking in material, accretion disks, eating the universe around you right, are all right. viable options. Right. The thing that's really interesting, and we've, we've talked about this in the past as well in shows, is like, did, do, did galaxies form or did the supermassive black hole at the heart of the galaxies form first, which one formed first, and now it really looks like they form together, Both. hand in hand. And, and this is something that's cropping up in all sorts of different formation things. We're now starting to think that planets formed at the same time that stars formed rather than coming later in the surrounding disks. It's now looking like the galaxy's greater structure and the supermassive black holes and the most massive systems in the early universe formed at the same time. When you have a giant cloud of material collapsing, it does this fabulous job of forming all the structures together. And while the scales are very different, the idea of the cloud collapsing, spinning up, forming a massive object in the center, fragmenting and forming smaller objects on the outskirt, this kind of physics is scalable. Right, right. So there's one tiny modification to this that that is and is by no means certain just this idea of primordial black holes contributing to this as well. This idea that there were folds of space in the universe over densities in the early universe where the matter was so dense that you could have black holes form naturally and that would theoretically allow you to have black holes which were smaller sizes than we see than, than the stellar mass, but also theoretically more massive ones. You could theoretically get a, a black hole with a thousand times the mass of the sun just forming just instantaneously at the beginning of the universe and then unleashed. And so theoretically, some of these could also serve as, as the starting points of some of these larger anchors as well. And, and the messiness of this comes from the combination of not knowing for certain whether or not Hawking radiation is real and black holes evaporate, in which case the smallest of the primordial black holes would have just gone away. Yeah. yeah. Um, and understanding what was the potential size distribution of these primordial black holes, microscopic ones are super easy to argue for the existence of, and they would all have evaporated. Right. Anything, massive uh, anything below um, 10 to the power of 12 kilograms will have evaporated already. So anything, it's about, it's like, a, it's a tiny asteroid. We'll have already. Yeah. And, and the larger ones are harder to argue for the existence of looking at um, 
the acoustic way acoustic waves that you can see in the cosmic microwave background as the echoes of what was going on prior to the formation of the cosmic microwave background. Yeah. And um, it is so one of the intriguing theories for to explain dark matter. So apparently if you know if you have black holes of of certain masses, I think they're like up to like asteroid size, but then also tens to thousands of times the mass of the sun, then that would explain the the distribution of dark matter. And they but perform a lot we of the same. But we haven't found them. But we haven't found the them. Macho no, project no. looked really hard. Yeah, no. And so and there so have that been idea attempts. Seems eliminated. Yeah, there have been attempts. They've been able to rule out certain masses of primordial black holes as dark matter, but there's other ones where it still could be the case. And there's some really interesting scientific, some interesting surveys that are still being done using gravitational lensing to try to find them. And it's this idea that won't go away, but also there's no evidence that they exist at all so far. So um, every day that goes by, it's less and less likely that it is primordial black holes that is causing dark matter and possibly even less case that they even do exist at all. But still, can't rule yeah. it out yet. And so I won't. I'm very much heart. team, it's a particle. <laughs> I, I am also very much team, it's a particle. But I, you know, I, I had a chance to ask um, Ned Wright, who's one of the you know, one of the fathers of modern cosmological thinking. And he and I was like, what's the what's the idea, the kind of the heretical thought that you sort of enjoy trolling other scientists because they can't say no? He's like, I like the idea that black holes are are dark matter because, you know, we just can't it fits the it fits the mass so far and we can't rule it out yet, even though it's ridiculous, which I thought was uh, was quite entertaining. And, and Ned Wright is someone who, yes, he's an amazing researcher, amazing scientist, but he is someone who I think generations of researchers are now grateful to because he figured out all of the, it's oh, so hairy to calculate, all of the equations for a universe that has dark matter, dark energy, and curvature parameters and all those things. He figured out all those equations, codified them, and then created the Ned Wright cosmology yes, the calculator. Yeah, I use them all the time. Oh, I love that calculator. And so for <laughs> me, he is always the person who created this web page that made me no longer have to cry doing calculations. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I use a very sort of sim for much simpler purposes than I think what you were trying to do. But I think that's that, you know, I'm looking for like back of the envelope calculations, but but I think it's great. Um, awesome. All right. Well, and I think next week we'll actually go deep into the actual Nobel Prize discovery. Now that you've got this this groundwork, and we will talk about the the different papers and the researchers who brought uh, who brought all those ideas to their modern day. So thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. Do you have some news and, for us this week? And I do. And this is where I have to say thank you to all the people out there who support us in doing everything we do. This show is made possible thanks to our patrons on patreon.com slash astronomy cast. And it's COVID times. I know a lot of you are struggling. And to those of you who are still finding it possible to keep supporting us month after month, you're allowing us to, to pay the folks who keep our stuff going. Richard Drum, who does the audio for the show, Ali Pelfrey, who does the video, Beth Johnson, who puts everything up on our website, um, and to offer them health benefits where they need it. So thank you for making it possible for to us to offer part-time people health care here in the United States. So I want to thank uh, Thomas Tubman, Claudia Mastrolani, Justin Proctor, Joe Wilkinson, David Gates, Jessica Feltz, Paul L. Hayden, neuter dude, Matthew Horstman, Brent Cranop, Iran Segev, Mark Grundy, Arthur Latzhall, Andrew Harmsworth, Tim Garris, J. Alex Anderson, uh, Bruno Letts, Jeremy Kerwin, Michelle Cullen, Mark Stephen Rasnick, Dustin A. Rolf, and John. Thank you all so much for everything you do to allow us to keep going. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. 
then they saved. And then they saved. Save. 582. Export. As a wave. Okay. Done. Safe. All right, um, I want to answer a question that I saw come up uh, earlier. Where is it? Because I know the answer, and the answer is weird. Okay, Galaxia asked, if you were to put the whole observable universe into a black hole, how big a radius would the black hole be? Do you know the answer to this question? No. I do. It's going to blow Go your mind. Go for it. It's going to blow your mind. Get any guesses. If you took all the mass of the observable universe and you put it into a black hole, what would be the size of the event horizon of that black hole? I'm guessing order of galaxy sized. The size of the observable universe. Yeah, I know. I have no idea. No, 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 no. That's the size of the event horizon. Oh, that actually makes total sense. I'm a moron. Yes, that makes sense. So, so it's a total coincidence. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we live in a black hole and it doesn't mean that the universe should collapse into a black hole because yeah. there's more universe outside the observable universe. The observable universe is merely a snapshot of time that we see today and um, billions of years in the past, the observable universe was much, was much smaller. And so it's similar in coincidences to the size what is the visual size of the moon and the sun from our perspective here on earth they happen to be the same size but it's a really cool idea that that the that if you did take all the matter in the observable universe and you made a black hole you get an event horizon that is about the size of the observable universe whoa cool and of course the reason why it's not a black hole is because there's more universe Yes. Right. We're not, the, the observable universe is not the universe. It's a teeny tiny little piece of the universe. Yeah. All the right. thing that we could be inside is a massive void, but statistically that's unlikely. Right. Yeah. In other words, it would, it would, we assume that the universe, what we see around us is what everybody sees around them. So. But there's the possibility that we're in a giant void that happens to be a lower density area, the size right. of the observable universe that is pulling us outwards, synthesizing yeah. dark energy, but that is probably not true. Right. Right. Uh, well, then you can't do anything. Like if you don't, right. if you can't, you can't do any astronomy at all. If you can't take that homogeneity into default. Right. Um, yes. Uh, John Drake says, could you talk about the recently released news of galaxies eating black holes? We kind of say that again. John Drake is asking, could you talk about the recently released news of galaxy galaxies eating black holes with the very large telescope? I mean, we kind of talked about that, but I don't know if there's any specific like galaxies. Eat black I don't holes know that specific story. I, there was a, I know the story he's talking about. There was a galaxy cluster that was seen to have a bunch of other galaxies with supermassive black holes locked around it and there was like a like a dozen black oh. holes all orbiting around it yeah i saw that yeah. um yeah that's just large scale structure formation in the early universe yeah yeah gravity. it's cool yeah it's yeah. fine it's fine don't worry about it yes yeah, um all right sir goosey asks what's inside a black hole i know it's called the singularity but what is that specifically no idea no idea Next question. Um, uh, there you go. Okay, so A Middles Twitch asks, so this kind of boggles my mind, but after the Big Bang, with matter being so dense in the beginning, how in the universe did it all just collapse into black holes everywhere from the get-go? What mechanism allowed everything to expand without this happening everywhere? Uh, the energy of the stuff prevented collapse. So... Um, the air in my room is not currently collapsing to the floor because the thermodynamics doesn't allow that. All the gas particles are going, hi, I'm racing around. I shall bounce off of you. I shall go over here now. Yeah. And it's that kinetic energy, that thermal energy in the system that 
holds it against yeah. um, collapse. And in the early universe, it was enough to hold it out against collapse in upon itself. But the other thing there was, is that you need an overdensity. You, like in order to get a black hole, you need to have overdensities and underdensities. So even if there was no energy holding it apart, until yeah. you get a place that has low density, and then you can have a place with high density, the high density is where the black holes will form and pull material in from the places of low density. But everything was was equally dense enough that a black hole couldn't form. But that, you know, I talked about this idea of these primordial black holes early on. They and could if there were tiny little folds of overdensity. What One of the cool things about the, it's called fine tuning of our universe. And it's one of the reasons that so many people believe in the idea of a multiverse where it just happens to be that we're in one of a myriad of universes that is fine tuned to right. allow the density structure we see to be what it is. If the universe had been just slightly more dense than what it is, um, we would have, instead of getting stars forming early on, gotten black holes forming early on right. and wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Star, neutron stars would have formed and then the neutron stars would have collapsed into black holes and then that's, you know, just nothing yeah. would have gotten going. It's, it's, it, it's, it is amazing. Like, that idea that that a star is being pulled in by its mutual gravity, that part you can understand. But the fact that yeah. it's being pushed out by the yeah. light pressure is the part that always breaks my brain. And the thermal pressure early on. Right, right, right. But just the fact that, that photons are pushing out while oh, yeah. gravity is pulling in. You would think that gravity would win every time, but it doesn't. It's balanced perfectly. Yes. Uh, Anti-gravity yeah. nonsense asks: Is there a chance for the material in the disk surrounding the black hole to form a star? Um, there are star-forming regions near black holes that are supermassive. The idea of a star collapsing out of the accretion disk, however, because it's so hot, it's too thermodynamically excited in, to get the kind of collapse you need to get a star. Right. So you need, like, you need cold gas to come together to form a yeah. proper star. Yeah. So you have a colder gas. This is why stars come from cold, giant molecular clouds. Um, you have cold gas that gets shocked into collapsing just past its balancing point. And as it fragments and collapses, the pieces heat up in the process, but not enough that they blast themselves apart. And, and it, limited, it limits the rate of collapse, so it doesn't just spraying down into a black right. hole. It slows the collapse down, allowing the star to form. So it's this really finely balanced process. And thermodynamics plays much more of a role in our universe than we often think about. Right. But I'm, you can get nucleosynthesis happening inside the oh, accretion yeah. disk of a black hole. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. You just can't get... And that's because gravity is compressing the disk, driving those reactions. But the disk is too energetic to allow knots of material to collapse down to form individual stars. So it's that fragmentation into smaller stars right. that's the missing piece. Right. And so you've just got like this donut around the black hole that's behaving kind of like a star. Yes. But it but it won't do anything else that's sort of star-like. And yes. then it'll be destroyed, gobbled up. Yes. Right. Um, uh, Unc Willie is asking, how would gravitational waves play into this? Wouldn't they carry off a fair bit of mass? And for the middle size thousand mole solar mass black holes, how much of the original mass would be lost through successive mergers? <sighs> So, so it carries away energy, which is equivalent to mass, and it is a reasonable chunk, but not. But it doesn't take away the, the mass percentage of, the black hole. of it. But it doesn't take. Like so well, so if you have like a twenty and a thirty solar mass 
black hole merging, you don't get a 50 solar mass black hole. You get a smaller mass black hole, but the amount of mass you lose isn't significant compared to, to the merger. So it's not like you're losing 50% of the merger's mass energy. I thought um, the, the, the energy of the gravitational wave, the mass equivalent is caused by the kinetic energy of the black holes themselves coming together that that's what's causing the rippling of space time is essentially the the moment they come together all of that kinetic energy is being converted into gravitational waves but they don't um it's don't... more than just the kinetic energy okay. yes that's the dominant factor right. but it's more than just the kinetic energy right um anti-gravity nonsense asks dark matter also falls inside black holes i blinked and now i'm kind of lost yes yes it does we don't talk about that well it's not like we're not supposed to talk about it. it's not like it's some kind it, of conspiracy. it's just we don't yeah. it's it's a simple statement yeah why we, we don't know how to treat it so we kind of ignore it right but i mean if you are the big fan of the particle then then and it's a particle that has no cross section that's why it probably not much of it falls into the black hole because yeah. it's not it's not getting that friction in the way that regular matter does yeah um yeah if you just make, if you sound like it's some kind of conspiracy what do you know what are you hiding um uh okay we've got three more minutes um Hal McKinney asks, how do they know how fast a black hole is spinning internally? They, they look at the rate of spinning of the accretion disk near the event horizon. And it's assumed that if you have an accretion disk going at a certain rate, you should have a black hole going at a certain rate. And there are equations that allow you to connect these two. It's, it's, a complicated relationship right. because you have to consider different kinds of drag and friction and there is a way to say if you see this the black holes r rotating between these two rates it's the gap in the black hole, the event horizon in the disk defines helps you know the the direction of the rotation of the black hole compared to the the direction of the rotation of the of the disk and well, so, and more than that, we can also see, so you see how big the gap is, and then you can also measure the velocities yeah. of the material on either side through the Doppler shifting of the light on one right. side and the light on the other. Yeah, and, and the part that makes it weird is you get the frame dragging of the black hole as it's torquing space-time around it, and so you can actually tell which way the black hole spin. And sometimes you can get a situation where a black hole is going one direction and it's and it's accretion disk is going in another direction. You can actually get this, you can detect that torque between the two. NASA has a has a web page on that I they, that I refer to all the time where I'm like, how do we know that again? Right. Um there's actually a paper that just came out. So one question someone asked me on YouTube and I didn't know the answer to this was what how fast is the black hole at the heart of the Milky Way spinning? And the answer is is up until this point, nobody knows. Nobody knows if it's spinning, how fast it's spinning. And no accretion disk. No accretion disk, yeah. But but the theoretically, and this came from Avi Loeb, of course, um, is theoretically you can measure the amount of frame dragging that's going on as the stars are going really close to the black hole and suss out its rotation speed and and direction based on how it's interacting with these stars as they whip around and and he's already started to constrain roughly that man does science in his sleep it's They're, crazy he, like, he, is he also picks really productive. good i think he picks really good students as well well it takes more than just that because it takes time to put words on to paper and to come up with the ideas yeah. and to. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> absolutely genius. One of the, one of the hardest working and nicest talk about nice people. Uh, I've is never everywhere. met him. I just see all the publications. Oh, he's a delight him. to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. Always super generous with his time. I don't even, again, he's probably some kind of robot. He's probably a time traveler. There's, He's got a thousand other Avi Loeb's working with him for him. He yeah. has Hermione's time. Yeah, machine. exactly. He's got the time twister. Yeah, that's it. 
Yeah. All right. Well, we've reached the end of our show. Um, Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us this week. Uh, Next week, we'll, of course, be talking about the Nobel Prize in Black Holes. Uh, But the CosmoQuest Hangout-a-thon is coming quickly. What's the date? October 24th, 25th, we are running 36 straight hours, starting 8 a.m. Pacific on Saturday. This is your time to give people this is what makes up the difference each month between what we bring in through the the Patreon accounts, the bits, the subs, the donations across all of our different platforms. There's a difference between what we get monthly and what it takes to pay all of our bills across the year. Hangout-a-thon is when we make up that difference. Right. And it's a dark and scary time out there, and we promise nothing but joy right. and silly and science yeah. for 36 hours. So join us for happiness. We will gather together every one of the people that you love into one place and try to put on a show for you. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, be encouraged by that. Continue to know that we're in this for the long haul. And, and help support the work that we do with CosmoQuest and, and all of the various sciencing that's going on. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thanks to our moderators who worked pretty hard today. Um, thank yeah. you to uh, you, Pamela, for bringing your brain. And uh, we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone.